Hello, my name is Connie Hess. I'm a cardiology fellow at the Duke Clinical Research Institute, and I'm joined here today by Dr. Sunil Rao, Associate Professor of Medicine at Duke University Medical Center and Associate Editor for the American Heart Journal. Today we'll be discussing the article, Successive Transradial Access for Coronary Procedures, Experience of Quebec Heart Lung Institute. Thank you for joining me here today, Dr. Rao. Thanks for having me. So I thought we'd start with a couple of background questions. Uh, first, what is the concern over using the radial artery for repeated procedures? So I think it's important to realize that there are some limitations to the radial access site. Uh, one is that it is a smaller artery. I mean, that's, why you, that's probably why you get less access site bleeding. But the reality is um, there's some very elegant uh, OCT studies, for example, that show that even with a single access attempt, there's a tremendous amount of inflammation and uh, subsequent neoendymal hyperplasia in the radial artery. So it's not like the femoral artery, where you can go back and repeat it a number of times. There is probably a limit to the number of times you can reaccess the radial artery before it completely becomes closed off and occluded. And what are the current existing strategies to reduce risk of radial artery occlusion, and how effective are they? So the major uh, thing, the strategy that really prevents radial artery occlusion is so-called non-occlusive hemostasis or patent hemostasis. It's been studied now in two randomized trials. And what that really means is applying enough pressure to the radial artery after the procedure to get hemostasis, but not so much that you actually limit antegrade flow. And uh, the trials have been so overwhelmingly positive that it's really considered to be a best practice uh, to use non-occlusive hemostasis after the procedure. That, along with adequate anticoagulation, is a very nice randomized trial of two different heparin doses that was done by Eva Bernat in the Czech Republic um, that showed that 5,000 units of heparin is really better than lower doses. Um, using smaller diameter sheaths, for example, to minimize the amount of trauma. And then the other thing that we all believe probably reduces the risk of radial artery occlusion, at least long term, is to limit the number of times that you access the radial artery. I see. So with this background in mind, what did the study uh, authors look at and what were the main findings? Well, you know, I love this study because I think it really addresses an important question that a lot of us ask, but very few of us actually have the, uh, the guts to, to tackle. And that's what's great about this group is that they ask the question, how many times can you actually access a radial artery? And what is the risk of occlusion chronically with each subsequent access? And so that's what they looked at in a, in a single center retrospective database. Now, although it's single center, this is a very high volume center. They're a very, very high proportion of radial, and they're all very proficient operators. So this is a uh, sort of an ideal setting in which to examine this. Also, there tends to be, in this particular practice, relative consistency in the way they do things. So there's not, there are minimal confounders, although we have to keep in mind it's an observational study. Now, you did, um, actually, sorry, uh, the main findings of the study, did they find that you can use the radial artery for successive attempts, or? Absolutely, so what they found was that some patients, they access six, seven times, which is pretty surprising. Uh, but one of the most important findings, and I think the most important finding for the clinical community, is that each successive attempt at radial access resulted in a 5% increase in radial artery occlusion. And the majority of the access site failures with subsequent sticks, so in other words, a patient's already had one, the next time you stick, the reason that fails is not because of spasm. It's actually because the radial artery is already occluded. And the final important finding is they looked at what are the predictors in a multivariable analysis of subsequent radial artery occlusion. What they found were three main factors that came out after adjustment. One is female gender. The second is prior coronary artery bypass grafting. And the third was repeated access. So female gender is interesting because we know, for example, that radial procedures may be more difficult to complete in women, and yet they're at higher risk for femoral bleeding. Uh, you're helping us with the Safe PCI for Women trial. We're examining the role of radial approach in that particular high-risk population. Prior coronary artery bypass grafting may simply be a surrogate for more extensive vascular disease, for example. And then again, repeated access attempts likely result in um, uh, an additive effect with respect to arterial trauma. Uh, resulting in more robust neoendymal hyperplasia and subsequent radial artery occlusion. I see. Now, you did allude to the fact that this study was performed at a very mature radial site with mm -hmm. operators who do high volumes and uh, are consistent in their practices, and I, I agree. I think this is really the ideal study to look at this question. However, on the flip side, do you think that this affects the generalizability of the results to lower volume sites, for example, a lot of those sites in the U.S.? Yeah, I do, I do. And I think the reason it probably limits that is because 
It's not clear yet. Um, we simply don't know what the landscape of practice is for radial operators in the U.S. We don't know how many people are practicing patent hemostasis. We don't know what dose of heparin they're giving. The databases aren't robust enough to pick that up. So there probably is going to be a little bit of challenge in generalizing this. What I will say, though, is that in general, from what I understand speaking with my Canadian colleagues, non-occlusive hemostasis is not considered standard care there. So if anything, the risk of subsequent occlusion with each repeated access may be lower than what the, uh, the, sites actually, what the study actually found. I see. And it sounds like for physiologic reasons that uh, repeated radial access is actually a limitation of this approach. However, uh, do you think looking forward that maybe there is a better strategy out there to reduce this complication that we just haven't found yet? Yeah, I mean, I think we can be really creative about a lot of this stuff, right? I mean, if the fundamental pathophysiology is, is arterial trauma and new animal hyperplasia, I mean, we can go, uh, you know, we can be as fantastical as to think maybe we need a drug eluting sheath. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some really interesting sort of engineering studies that, uh, that are in the literature about nitric oxide eluting sheaths, for example, and reducing arterial trauma. Whether that will translate into any real clinical strategy remains to be seen. But uh, I think you're right. I mean, it's important to underscore that one of the big limitations of radial approach is radial artery occlusion. And that's why I think it's really important for clinicians to do everything they can to prevent it. Well, thank you, Dr. Raff, for joining me and for sharing your insights. And to read the full text of this article, please visit the March issue of the American Heart Journal. Thank you for joining us.